as uh, Nathan said, I am an archaeologist. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of stepping out of my wheelhouse a little bit here because um, he was very kind to me earlier. We were talking, he said, well, you know, we, we think of you, we, we Tibetologists think of you as a Tibetologist, and I kind of go, uh-oh, that might or might not be good, I'm not sure, because I, I don't do the language. I used to do archaeology on the Tibetan Plateau until relatively recently, but uh, that became very difficult for foreigners, so I no longer work there. So we were able to then move into Mustang in the fringe of the Tibetan Plateau, which made all the difference in the world in terms of permits. And so we're working in the Tibetan world, but in a very different capacity with the, you know, with the cooperation of the government rather than the active resistance to foreign archaeologists being present in the region. So uh, you'll see that the title is a little tiny bit different than the title that might have advertised this lecture. Uh, you'll notice there's a question mark at the end of that. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, I, I believe that I have some artifacts that are certainly Buddhist-like. Um, not being a specialist in Indian Buddhism, uh, being the archaeologist that I am, I have interpretations of them that I'll share with you. And you can tell me if I'm wrong, and I really don't mind. Um, that's what we are here for, is to exchange ideas and to get new concepts going and to be told, well, that was really stupid, don't think that way. Um, please don't be so brutal if that's the way you feel about it. But in any case, I'll try to give you a, a good reading on why I think the materials that we have are Buddhist in nature, even though the dates that I'm showing you here are relatively early as far as Nepalese Buddhism goes. And I'll have an explanation about how I think they got there which may or may not be correct, but it's the, the best one I can offer at this point, based on the material culture and my own reading of the way in which uh, these things have moved around the landscape in the past. So with that background in mind, you know, we all see images like this in our work somewhere. It, you know, Buddhism starts here, and then the arrows send you off in different directions with different time frames. And this one is, you know, showing where the Buddhism supposedly went in the, up until about 600 AD or so. Uh, you'll notice one area that it eludes entirely is most of Nepal. That is, the arrows don't go up into any place, into the Himalaya, from, at least from the south. If you're going anywhere, it simply goes around the edges. Here's another image that um, does a little better. It's got a blue arrow that's coming out of somewhere in India and going across the Himalayas into the Tibetan Plateau. But again, this one is kind of unsatisfactory too. And I don't mean to make too much of these. That is, these are really you know, didactic things just to get people to think about space and movement of people. But what I'd really like to emphasize is that what I'm trying to get across in aspects of today's lecture is really all about a, a didactic, not a didactic, but a kind of think about an embodied approach to this. That is, there are people on the landscape. And there are people that have objects that I'll be talking about, and they put them into context that were some, somewhat surprising. And so the question is, if they're Buddhist, how did they get them? Where did they come from? What did they mean to them? Now, I don't mean that I'll be able to answer that question in any kind of significant detail. I'm no mind reader of the dead in the past, nor the present for that matter. But my point is, is that if we think about it as an embodied process, that is, of people moving around the landscape or moving ideas around landscapes, then what we can do is have a better understanding of what these objects might in fact mean in the distant past of this region. So where I'm going to take you then is in Upper Mustan in Nepal. And if you look, there's Lomantan. Some of you may have been there. I know you've been there. Times Christian is back in the background. Anybody else been to Lomantan? Okay. Oh, you have. When did you go? Uh, the first time in 2008. Okay. Uh, Okay, very good. Well, I'm no other story either, but you know, I, I don't do those things, but you can see where I'm going with this. So there's Lomantan. And if you go a little bit further to the north and to the east in this case, over the uh, big ridge, you go to a little place called Samzong. And Samzong is a small village that uh, had at one time a fairly large uh, Buddhist era archeological, well, Buddhist era site on it. It's now a small village that actually has picked itself up and moved to the other side of the ridge that you climb over because they claim that their water is drying up and that uh, the glaciers are melting inappropriately and therefore they have to leave. And so housing has been made for them on the other side of the river. But 
back in the day, the day I'm talking about between what, roughly 500, 400, and 650 AD, this was a thriving community in this region. And one of the things that we focused our attention on in the work that we've been doing in Upper Mustang for the last oh, 10 or 11 years now is that we discovered this archaeological site called Samzong. Now, some of you, I don't know if, Christian, you've heard any of this before. Perhaps you have. I don't know, if Jason, I don't know if you've heard any of it before either. So I apologize to those of you who've heard some of this, but apparently not enough of you have to worry about, so I can then talk about this with some authority. So in any case, uh, here's this location called Samzong. And this is a, a nice three-dimensional view of this place. And the, the, what you're looking at is a sheer cliff. And if you look carefully at the base of the cliff, you'll notice that there are large blocks of material that have fallen off the base. And those large blocks of material, when they fell off, exposed some holes that you see there in the side. And the local villagers would call these, well, you see the caves. Well, they're not really caves in this particular case. They're called shaft tombs. And what that means is that someone goes on the surface, walks to it, digs a, digs a tunnel down to whatever depth they feel like they're going, and then opens a chamber, and then uses that chamber for some purpose. In this case, um, these were invisible as of late as 2009. That is, they were not there. No one there knew their presence. Uh, what happened for us, fortunately, was that there was an earthquake, a very small one, but enough to actually move the, move the earth here. It shook off those big chunks of soil and laid them out so that when we walked up the valley the very first time in 2010, we saw them. And so we were able then to get inside them and to begin to work with them. There's 10 different shaft tombs here. They each have a set of numbers that we assign to them, sort of randomly, as you can see. Um, just in terms of how we encountered them. Uh, you'll notice one thing about this. I'm not going to belabor the archaeological part of this, but the only way you can work in this site is by hanging on ropes. That is, you have to actually use climbing gear. You repel, you do all those things that climbers do because there's no other easy access to these places right now. Um, in the past, people would have walked up that slope behind them, dug their shafts down into the soil, and been there for, you know, use them for their purposes. So the two of the shafts that I'm going to talk about right now, oops, I'm sorry, are going to be number five and number four. It's actually number one and number four turned out to be connected. We didn't know that until we were really able to get inside it more carefully, more effectively. It had four different chambers within, within it, so we were able to uh, excavate the material fairly carefully from those. So these are then the two chambers that I'll be talking about for the remainder of this conversation. This is an image from National Geographic magazine that was published back in, I believe, 2011 or, 2000, I think, 2012. Maybe 2014, <laughs> sorry. It's one of those years in the past. And so <laughs> I apologize for the image in one sense. That is, you know, when, when you work with something like National Geographic, graphic, what you have to do is they have to find ways to um, sex it up a little bit. And so we never found this context like this because the roofs had all collapsed and the chambers were full of dirt and it was a mess. And unfortunately, that meant the archaeological context was a bit of a mess as well. So it wasn't the kind of context that we would normally like to have. So we, we did excavate as carefully as we could under the constraints. And then they asked us, well, what do you think it really looked like? And so we tried to give them an idea about what it really looked like. And this is what you see. Um, you see an individual in a coffin. I'll show some of these in a moment. Um, you see some artifacts on the floor. You see some animal heads, sheep and goat and yak and horse. Or those were all found in that context as well. And you see something off to the right-hand side uh, that's a gold and silver mask that I'll have some conversation about in a moment. Um, the particular orientation of these things is unclear to us, but I think that's not terribly bad given the jumbled nature, excuse me, of the context. You'll notice that one individual lying on the floor, um, that, that isn't exactly made up by National Geographic, but it's close. Um, there were two individuals in this context. Uh, we said, no, it's not a whole one. We only could find parts of this person but they made it into a whole person. So uh, don't worry about this person for right now. I want to worry about the person inside the chamber, inside the coffin, because that's the person of interest in this context. 
So here's what the coffin looks like right now. And so I, I just ask you to gaze on this for a moment and remember some of the motifs that you see because you'll see them again in different formats and different contexts that will provide us with some, some clue as to what's going on in terms of the relationships of the people who live in this region and the exterior uh, relations they may have had in the distant past. Uh, the wood is a uh, local wood. Some of it's been imported from down below. Um, it's painted only on that one side. Um, there's no other painting or other kind of modification other than making a nice stone, co uh, sorry, a wooden coffin in this context. As I promised, here's the, the mask that we found inside that coffin. So picture the coffin sitting as, as you saw on the, on the back of the chamber and inside this kind of jumbled rock because a stone had almost had fallen right into the coffin and you know, did some damage to the individual that was inside, but you know, not enough to actually make a difference. Um, this is what we find. Um, it's a relatively large mask. You can see that it's been painted. It's done in repoussé technique. You know, the nose is kind of projecting. Uh, the eyes are fairly well painted on one side. Um, it's made out of gold and silver. So you see a gold face on this, and then you see a silver backing. You don't see that very well, but if you look to the left-hand side of the image, you'll see some silvery color. That's where the gold has washed away in one sense. Um, we did some work over at UCL on this particular mask. And it turns out that the amount of gold that one would need to make a mask the size, and you can see the scale down below, that's 10 centimeters, uh, you need a piece of gold about the size of a large pea. So gold is quite malleable, obviously, and so what they did with this was to bend it, shape it, bend it, bend it, push it, and make it very, very thin. And the silver behind it as well is very thin. So it's a, it's a fairly remarkable piece of, of art as well as, for me, the archaeologist, trying to understand what this is all about. So, this is the mask from inside that context. Now, here's where things get a little more curious about this mask, and I'm gonna to have to ask you to at least bear with me on this conversation because I didn't believe it at first. So it's important for you to understand I was skeptical. And when I say skeptical, I'm looking at the mask going, yes, okay. And I have a, a graduate student who is uh, training in France right now. <coughs> And you know, she's been working on the project for a number of years. And she said, look what I've discovered. <laughs> okay, show me what you've discovered. You know, she's been looking at these photos a lot more carefully apparently than I have. But if you look really carefully, and I, I do mean carefully, I've convinced myself that it actually is there. Maybe this is a confirmation bias, but I do believe there's something there that bears some consideration. Can you see what I'm looking for right there? You can't, that's okay, you don't have to. The first time I looked at it, I didn't see it. You're shaking your head yes though. Oh, brilliant, you actually see it, good. It's not like I made this up, is it? <laughs> it's a swastika on the face of this individual. Now, I'll show you where I think it is. I mean, it might be a little more difficult to see. You can see this, you can see this part of it fairly clearly, no? Another image I have will actually show this arm here and then the other on yeah. this side. So it actually comes through fairly clearly once you see it. And I did ask my student, I, before I came here, I said, look, Marion, do you really believe there's a swastika here? Convince me one more time. So she didn't, these are not faked photos. I just simply blew it up so you can see this image. So there's a swastika on the face of this individual. Okay, that's kind of interesting to know. And this was a, this was, this is certainly unheard of in Nepal, and you'll see in a moment that it's also unheard of in other places where there's a similar mortuary tradition in, in this region. Well, if that one's a little more difficult to see, but thank you for being so observant and brilliantly able to capture the essence of this argument, I bet you can find this one more clearly. Everybody sees this, well, you're just not working with me today. Let me blow this one up again to let you see it. There it is right there. It's the same kind of mask, gold, silver, much thinner though, very, very thin work. It's, it's actually, unfortunately, has completely, it's almost completely disintegrated. We've not been able to bring these out of the location in which they were found. Uh, the Nepali government owns this only in name. That is, they don't 
And the villagers own this. They will not let it out of their sight. But now all it is is a bag of dust, unfortunately. Almost a bag of dust. So we have another mask then. We'll go back just to look at it. And it's, it's, it's a little warped because the way in which it was found in context was it was folded in on itself like a little origami. So unfolding it then revealed this, but it also fell apart during that process of seeing what it actually was. So it's the same idea though, gold and silver. And painted, you can see the beard and mouth, and you can see at least, you can see both of the eyes. They've just been moved around a bit. All right, so we've got two golden masks with swastikas on them, which are curious in themselves. Swastikas don't usually appear in this part of Nepal until much later in time. But then we also encountered something like this, which is more clearly something that is related to Buddhism. I'm, you'll notice I'm saying I'm, I'm being cautious about that attribution because I, I'm, I will make an interpretation of this at some point, but I'm not ready to do so yet. This is a, this is a very large tzatza or a, a clay plaque. And the way in which it is constructed is about 15 centimeters from top to bottom, so there's no scale in this one. But you know, it's basically a big lump of clay that's been impressed with a mold, and the mold presses that down, and then when it's finished, it's not fired in any sense. It was placed inside a tomb context. You'll notice then that there is painting on it, so it was one time painted, at least with red, and other colors we're not so certain about. As you can see, it's not in terribly great shape, and I'll show some other images as well that, unfortunately, it's even in worse shape today, but it's fairly clear as to, at least you can see imagery, figures seated on a throne, you can see individuals standing beside, you can see other things around it that I'll make an attempt to interpret in a moment. So the, two, the first golden mask was found in tomb five with the individual inside the coffin. The golden mask I showed, the second one, was found in tomb one, or one four, as I call it, with, in a totally different context with no coffin associated with it, but it was inside that context. This tzatza is found in that context as well. So there's that one and that, and then there's something else as well. Um, when I first saw this, I had it upside down. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what this is is a clay model of a chorten or a stupa. And the way in which these are made is, is that what you're seeing down below is the, is the clay that creates the, uh, you know, put into a mold. You jam it into a mold, and then what you do eventually is to cut off that bottom part. Uh, the bottom part should have been cut off somewhat higher, but in this particular case it wasn't. And so again, this is a very clearly, it's got, well, it's a stupa slash chorten. I'm calling it Buddhist right now only because that's what I think it's likely to be. Uh, again, painted in inside tomb one as well. And then the last thing is a very curious object that I won't talk much more about because I had, very, had a very difficult time trying to find analogs of this in any, any published literature that I have access to. Um, it's a clay um, figure. And if you look really carefully, you see some potentially distinguishing features of it. Down at the bottom, you can see something that looks like an ear. Notice. It's got some red pigment inside. Are you, how is your observational skill at this point? You see the ear? Good. Yeah. Okay. So she sees that, so it must mean it's there, actually. So in any case, there's an ear. And if you look at the top, um, the, we, we've talked to a lot of people about this. and. Many people, not everyone, but many people believe that what we're looking at is the, it's a sculptured head of uh, the Buddha with likely that's its Ushanisha on top of his head. Now, do I know that for sure? I don't know. Uh, you're skeptical, that's okay. Um, painted red again, broken in this fashion, and it's about this large around. So it's relatively large. The pieces, they're gone, so we don't know, we have nothing else. So we've got those objects then. Some gold masks, uh, very large tzatza, a chorten image, and then we've got this. So, as I say, you know, you can find all sorts of imagery of the, the Buddha and his uh, Ushanisha, but nothing quite like this that I've seen in clay, unfired clay, again, as it stands. All right, well, let's put this stuff in time, because as an archaeologist, this is one of the things I have to do, is to understand when these things are, so that I can make sense of making comparisons then one to the other. So here's uh, radiocarbon dates from the Samsung context. So what you're looking at then is those are the bars of the probabilities of those dates. And the red bars are more probable times than other times. Uh, the problem is, is that 
if you know anything about radiocarbon dating, you know that we have to calibrate the radiocarbon years against calendar years. And what happens is that calibration curve in some places is really ugly. Sometimes it's nice and straight and you get one date across and everyone's happy. But what happens in this case is the calibration curve gets all chunky. And so what that means is that there are some probabilities then that are in there that are slightly higher or slightly lower than what we might like. But, you know, we live with that. And if you take a look then at the, the way in which these days are distributed, you can see fairly clearly that the majority of them fall. You know, there's a number that falls sometime between roughly, you know, 400 and, and roughly 550. And then there's another batch that goes from about 550 to somewhat beyond in 700 or so. And we've got an outlier way up there. Um, the two contexts, though, that I'm talking about, that is the golden mask from tomb 5, and the uh, artifacts that I'm attributing to some kind of Buddhist thinking. Here's the tomb five date, and you'll see how relatively early that is. And then you'll see the dates of the other objects. So they're early, all things being equal. And you can take those bars for what they're worth, but if you want to have an average date, they come in sometime around, let's just say 550 AD or so. So for here, that's early in terms of any presence of anything that you would remotely want to talk about that is Buddhism. Simply shouldn't be here at this time. Uh, shouldn't be here means maybe they haven't been discovered yet. But in this case, you know, this is the best data we have right now to talk about anything that looks like Buddhism in the Himalayan arc of this region. Well, all right, let's look at some other lines of evidence then to, to get a sense of what other people think is the presence or the appearance of Buddhism in the region. And we go now to a place called Logekar. Did you get to go to Logekar? Okay, so a nice slide of Logekar. And if you know about what Logekar is all about, it's, you know, the, the tourism authority has put up the, a very nice sign on it. And the date on it, don't worry about the details, I'll tell you the details. They basically say um, sometime in the eighth century is when Logekar is supposed to have been founded. All right, so that's what they say as to when this is the case. Am I got that right? Uh, yeah, eighth century. And the context, of course, if you know something about the way in which Buddhism has supposedly uh, gone into Nepal from the Tibetan plateau, it all has to do with the founding of Samye and the construction of the Samye monastery and temple complex. Um, the story goes that they were having a great deal of time building Samye. Gets built, demon knocks it down gets built, demon knocks it down. This is not convenient. So what happens then is that someone asks this individual, Padmasabhava or you know, Guru Rinpoche, to go take care of the demon that lives in that part of the world. The demon, uh, uh, Guru Rinpoche goes, um, slays the demon. The demon's bodily parts are spread all over that part of the valley. And the monastery is then constructed at that point. If you've seen those images of the supine, supine demoness as well, this is one of the things pinning her down, is this monastery that's called Logekar. So the dates are supposed to be 8th century. Well, if that's the case, um, and we take a look then at our radiocarbon dates, and let's see, we could even push that a little bit further to the left if we wanted to, kind of thinking, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. It supposedly was founded after Samye. Samye is something like 775 AD. If that's the case, that red line says that's when Logekar should have been founded. And so, very clearly then, everything that we have at Samsung, with the exception of that one outlying radiocarbon date, um, really is much earlier than this. So, whatever we have is not related to the founding of Logekar, at least as far as we can tell right now. Fine. Do we have any other evidence that we can come up with the, to tie these objects into a Buddhist presence that, that is still somewhat unknown. And I can give you a bit of a hint on that evidence right now. So the circle indicates the radiocarbon dates that we talked about from Samsung. And so the other radiocarbon dates that you see there, now of course we know there's Buddhism in the valley much after this, of course there is. All the painting, all the monasteries, there's all that stuff is there. So I don't have to prove to you that there's a Buddhist presence in the valley, uh, the Kalagandaki Valley, Upper Mustang, after the founding of Logekar. But I want to know whether or not there's any other, any other indicators of an earlier presence of Buddhism that we have identified in the region. And the answer is not yet. 
and maybe not ever. And so those two lines you see to those two radiocarbon dates, this is work that's being done by my graduate student, uh, Marian Poo. And she's been doing a, a pedestrian survey of Upper Mustang and walking all the ba basically all the way from the border down to the you know down to Johnson essentially, and essentially what she's been trying to do is to locate any number of archaeological sites by that process, and a number of the sites then that she's been able to obtain radiocarbon samples from are indicated on this image. So there's many more sites that she's found. And we know a lot of them, but these are the only ones that have been dated. And as you can see, the dates are late, aren't they? you know, 1000 AD, you know, 950 AD, give or take. These are both chortons that are constructed someplace in Upper Mustang. So we know there's a presence there that is early. It's, it's certainly after Logekar, but it's nothing is as early at this point as we have at Samzong. So whatever, if we, if we agree that what we have at Samzong is Buddhist, then we have to explain where it's coming from with, un, under its own term. It is not coming from a plateau source, insofar as I can tell, at least we can talk more about that in a moment. So, let's now turn back to our region for a second, back to Samsung, and talk about its kind of its geographic location. This is where the archaeologist comes back in again. What you're looking at here are glass beads. And glass beads are a remarkably good indicator of the movement of trade because you can track them using different kinds of uh, technologies. And what you're looking at in the upper left-hand side are glass beads from what's now modern Pakistan. You know, it would be called the Sindh if you, uh, at least that's what our analyst called it. If you take a look at the register of green beads in the middle, you find those are coming out of uh, Sasanian context. In other words, fairly far west in what would be, I think, modern Iran today. So that was a bit of a surprise for us. And then the remainder of the beads, you'll notice that they're, the black numbers are called um, Indo, Indian Southeast Asian ones. Well, some of them are from, excuse me, in the you know, relatively far north in India. And some of them are actually found from either very southern India or also uh, Sri Lanka or even possibly Thailand. So what's being said here is that this place is hardly isolated. So Samsung looks like it's nowhere, but yet they're getting goods from somewhere, and these somewheres are very far flung. So, not, so it's not as if you can't get there from here, okay? Things are moving. This is not the only thing that's moving in this region. You'll see this image again, this object. This is a copper ladle. And we've been doing, again, the uh, archaeometallurgy on this, and we find that the, we don't know if this was exactly made in India, but the chemical signature of this object say this is of northern Indian origin. That is, the, the shaping as well as the composition are likely having a northern Indian source. Where? Can't say exactly where, but we know that it's not local. They're not making these things in Samsung. They're making them someplace else. If you want other things, and you'll see another reason to talk about this mirror in, in a bit, um, this is a bronze mirror that is uh, very clearly of uh, Tibetan or Central Asian origin. Um, it was found in Samdong 5 with the individual in the stone coffin. Uh, the motif on it is very clearly from, you know, my, our colleague John Beleza would call this uh, Central Asian Tibetan. I think he's right. Um, he has examples of this that I've seen from private collections. So it feels pretty good that this is something coming from plateau now back down into this region. It is not a chemical composition that you see being constructed anywhere in India at this time. So it's someplace, someplace else. And if you're not happy with that, then I'll give you something else to be slightly happy about then. Um, Chinese silk. So this is a very crude Chinese silk. It's not as fancy as some of the Chinese silks you'll see in other contexts but it's uh, basically been identified by our folks working on this as a real um, crude but Chinese silk that's been, uh, been covered with uh, cinnabar. So we don't know where the cinnabar is actually from, but we do know the silk is not local. It's not from India. It's not from any place else that we know of. It's coming from someplace that way. And to give you a sense of what that way means, I'll, let me show you this image right here. This is supposed to be, uh, Tim Williams and his colleagues at UCL have been developing over the years a, a way to think about the Silk Roads as a, as a kind of a, a way to conceive of them in a, a larger sense for uh, entry into uh, the, sorry, the, 
What is that thing I'm thinking about? You know, the register of all those important places, archaeological on the planet. I'm looking at you because you're an archaeologist. You should be able to tell me this. <laughs> uh, you know, these are basically, they're looking at nominations for historic properties for the United Nations. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. You're really on today. That's good. <laughs> So what you're looking at then, if you look at carefully at this image, you see the Tibetan plateau, of course, to the north, and then what you find, the Himalayas, in between that and the Indian subcontinent. The orange line coming down is supposed to be one of the primary routes from the northwest onto the plateau down this direction. You'll notice then that there's a feeder line that comes off from the very upper left-hand side down into India itself, and then you'll see three different routes that have been proposed to go across the Himalayas that are supposedly documented by, by historical or other literature. Um, I know of one for sure, and that's the one that goes through Mustang. That's the one in the middle right there that starts, you can see down the Lumbini and then going up to Lamantang and then off into the Himalayas at that point. So I'm feeling, I'm feeling fairly confident that that really is a spur route that comes either off to or onto the Silk Road from some direction. But here's my point, that is that objects from the Indian uh, subcontinent are going up into this region and there's things coming down into Samsung from somewhere else probably from maybe on the plateau, possibly from the Northwest Himalayas. So this is the connection I'm trying to offer you now as a way to begin to think about how the provenience of the objects that I've showed you, what the likely source of them happen, that may, may well happen to be. So let's go back to our images now and try to work through what their meanings might be and connect them to a larger place. So the first thing I can do for you is to give you a sense of uh, thinking about them as a class of objects. I'm gonna, we're talking about satsan now, all right? And those have been studied fairly exhaustively in the Tibetan plateau. And I know they've been studied in the Indian subcontinent, but you don't see much of this work being done in Nepal, certainly. Uh, you see some of it in Afghanistan and sort of the northwestern part of the Buddhist world. Nepal still is this big hole in the map where we really don't have much of a, a clear sense of data on this. So once I go through you know, as a class, then what we'll do is I'll try to give you a sense of what these things might look like from a stylistic standpoint. So let's talk about as a class. Um, I, saw, I have two sources that help me understand this a bit. Um, you'll see them both down at the bottom. And they suggest that uh, objects, satsa of some kind or another, could be as late, beginning as late as the seventh century AD or possibly as early as the second century AD. So they, they have a long span of time, all right? Notice that the Tibetan examples, that is the only ones we know about on the plateau so far, and this has been fairly exhaustively studied, it, it, they really only begin to be found or to be discussed in literature between the eighth and ninth centuries AD. So they're relatively late as objects on the plateau, but they're relatively early then, if you will, when you look at them from an Indian perspective. How early? Well, that's something that's still open to me because finding, finding publications of these relatively humble artifacts is really difficult to find. Everyone wants to talk about the mural painting and everyone wants to talk about the beautiful sculptures. No one wants to talk about the little messy, you know, tzatza, unless, unless they've got writing on them. That makes everybody excited at that point. Well, I don't have writing on mine at this stage. But if we look at the time frame just for a moment then, if you believe the later time frame to the seventh century, you'll see that some of the possibilities overlap just a bit with the very tail of the radiocarbon dates from, from Samsung. Notice the ones down at the bottom, those are the places where the tzatza were found in context one, chamber one. If you believe that, then they could be dating to that period, but maybe not. It's hard to tell because those are really outside the likely probability estimate of where those dates are, but it's possible. So they could be as late as that, but that still doesn't help us much then with the swastikas on the faces of our friends, unless we don't believe that those are actually relating to Buddhism. So we'll see. Let's take a look at this stylistically now for a moment. So 
there's the image, and I now thank David Pritzker for helping me with this because he was very, I, you know, I talked about this in a different context a few years ago in a very a much, less, uh, much less studied way. And he said, I'll find some, I'll get something for you, I'll help you out on this. And he was very kind about helping me find imagery because this is stuff that he obviously is working on as well. So look very carefully then at the image then. And what I want to show you is a piece of this particular tzatza that's important. I've blown that bottom of the throne up, and I'm asking now, you've got the eye, what do you see in this, what am I trying to show you in this image right now? And you're, you're, you're still working on it, I know, but it's okay. That's okay. Are you seeing something? Yeah, it's a piece of cloth hanging down on the throne. That's... Could be, hard to say what that is, but what are those two little things beside it? There's where I'm trying to get your attention. Over there, the feet of the stool, or there are possibly lions. Mm. Did I hear you, you use the word lion? Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, that's of course projecting. <laughs> yeah, I'm projecting too, but you know, that's, that's what we do when we look at artifacts like this. We project and go, oh, maybe, maybe not. So I'm asking you to look at, especially the one on the left, because that one is preserved. One on the right has been damaged by whatever had happened to it in the cave. And what I'm suggesting and what David suggested to me as well is, if you take a look at an image like this, this is a 7th century bronze from Swat. And I'm not, I mean, it's obviously far more elaborate, far more complex, but what is the image, what is the individual sitting on? A throne and what's beside the throne supporting it are two lions. Notice the date, relatively early, 7th to 8th century, northwestern Himalayan region, all right? That's one. There are others as well. I'll just show you a few. Here's one from Gilgit that is pretty much the same general age, a bit earlier though in this particular case, a sixth century Gilgit. So I'm making a fairly direct statement that suggests that the lions that you see on the tzatza of supporting my little guy are in fact likely to be lions derived from an artistic tradition that comes out of the northwestern Himalayas. We'll see. The one thing that we do not have, hold on, one thing we do not have, we have no inscriptions on any of these, so I can't answer anything more about that. Yes, sir? But the, the parallel is very good because you see that on the bronze, there's the little circles. Yeah. And that's replicated in your sights of the bronze. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I feel good at this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is a it's good comparison. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that level of support because, you know, as I said, I kind of stick myself out a little bit on these things. So in any case, I feel fairly We're comfortable. Very friendly. Oh, no, it's all right. <laughs> in any case, uh, this is suggesting a northwestern Himalayan connection is what I would argue in this instance with this particular object. Here it gets a little trickier because I, I can't really answer this. This is that chorten that we have or that stupa. You know, finding examples from the Indian literature is very difficult. You can find ones. You know, I was looking online and uh, Indians have stuff published in a site in uh, Mongolia, Karakoto. It's like, great, that's not much help for me, especially when they're all dating to the 12th century or so. So I don't have a direct time frame that I can give you for these chortons in, in, in other analogs. These are from, Af this one is from Afghanistan. This is one of the closest analogs I could find. It's said to be early, notice my fingers, but they don't, of course, say how early the site was in terms of that publication. So I have analogs that suggest they're in northwestern Himalayan venues relatively early in time, but how much earlier, I really can't say. But Chris, do you think this was the two? The one represents one stupa only? Yeah. With stairs, and the other represents the stupa with eight stupas around. That's the one you have. Okay. That is still made today. Okay. But this one's not, the one that we've got in the context though isn't. <laughs> the Afghanistan one is not made. Okay, good. Thank you for correcting me on that. I mean, I'll just have to look harder for better analogs from India. But, you know, this is what we found so far. So, so one connection I am making though is there's something going on to the northwest from where we are in Samson. There's commerce going up down north-south. Northwest has a different kind of connection. Let's talk about these masks a little bit now. There's a third mask I haven't shown you. It's just, it just came out of uh, the same context, number one, tomb number one, chamber number one. Um, it was also folded up as well. It was not as fancy. 
um, same construction, same technology. Uh, very, a little bit of paint on it, but nothing very significant. So the question then we have to ask ourselves is what about these masks and what are they telling us about the, the region? Because there are other gold masks from other contexts in Western Tibet. Now, these are not the scale. Um, the images were, you know, I have a scale for all of these. Um, the first the two on the left are from an archaeological site in Western Tibet called Chuflag, and the second one is from Gurgyam, which is very much near the, uh, the putative silver castle of, uh, of uh, you know, the Tutsi described in, the, in his travels in that region. Kyungbul Nulkar is the, the name of the place. Um, the Chuthag sample is about 15 centimeters, so it's relatively large, and the other two are quite small. They're only tiny little masks. Uh, so we've got those three masks. There's actually another mask that was found in northwestern India that I won't talk about now, but in the same Himalayan context as well, very similar to these. Um, you'll notice that they're, the one on the left is quite elaborate. It's got a turban and with different animal motifs on it. Amy Heller has talked a good deal about what she thinks the symbology of the, the uh, turban is and the animals on it. The other two um, have been less described um, for one reason or another. They notice their dates. The, the dates are between the first and second centuries of this uh, AD, give or take. Maybe a little bit later is the possibility. So clearly there is something going on in the Western Himalayas that's has these masks as part of the context. They're not the only ones though, that we see in this region. Um, the one on the left is from an archeological site in Xinjiang called Boma. You'll see the date, relatively contemporary with the other two. And then we have this great mask from a cemetery context in Kyrgyzstan that's dated 300 to 400 um, AD or CE. Um, you'll notice one thing on the Kyrgyzstan mask that you've seen before. Yeah. You've seen the, that motif of the tree, the, I interpret as a tree, I think others do as well, that was also on the coffin as well. So there's another stylistic connection if, you know, I don't know where it's coming from, except from there's an idea that that might be the case. So clearly there's golden masks around then that at least go to Mustan and then take themselves all the way back then to as far west as Kyrgyzstan. Now, some people have tried to stretch it way far back to the Greeks, and I just, let's just not go there. I mean, I can't, I can't get into diffusionism of that kind of craziness, but I can, I can only go so far. These work out pretty well for me just in terms of the dates. But that's not all that is interesting about these, these Western Tibetan tombs. Um, both of them have a context that are full of wooden box coffins as well. So the Tufanik ones you see there, um, you'll notice, and, and you don't see the other side, but they are not painted, as is the Mustang one. And then the Gurgen ones are a little bit worse for the wear, but they're not painted either. Now, one thing that may change some of these interpretations I'm about to show you is the Chinese have really been spending a lot of quality time working in Western Tibet now, excavating these sites. So I would expect a fairly significant publication coming out in another year or so that really describes these things in great detail. Among some of the things they found, um, they found some cannabis out here. They found some tea here. I mean, this is, not a, this is not a trivial location in terms of trade going back and forth in this region. But I show you these because the coffins are there and they have an obvious similarity to the ones in Mustang. And just to go back to that again, but I wanna show you that motif now. And so there's the Samzong motif. And notice the, this other coffin that we have from a Xiongu context in Xinjiang later but similar. So this X motif, I've seen it a lot now. I won't speculate more on it because you find it, I will speculate a little. Uh, you find it on pottery from this time frame. You find it in all sorts of different contexts which are quite interesting on the Tibetan plateau as well as across the Central Asian region down into Mustang. So I'd like to now kind of turn to an interpretation of why the masks are important in this context as part of the story. This is where I get in trouble with my colleagues, the Tibetologists, because they tell me that, oh really, you know, you can't say those things, but I'm gonna to try to say them anyway. <laughs> so, fortunately, I can use the authority of somebody really important in Tibetological <laughs> studies 
sent in Carme as somebody who can back this up. Um, this is work that he's done uh, using these sources. Um, these are textual sources that you can see here from Dunhuang and then two Bon texts. Now keep in mind that these are Bon texts written in later times, so they're not obviously even remotely contemporary, but they're describing times in the you know, earlier that mm -hmm. is described in these documents. And here's the way that Sampton describes these. And he, this paper is published now. We just never have received volume, unfortunately, um, one of our Shangchun conferences. So you'll notice the different categories of material. And so there's, there's two on here that I think would be, uh, that connect two things I've shown you so far. And those would be the first one, which is the yellow gold face image. And Sampton believed the Zal is connected to the golden mask. And then the other one at the bottom, number five, is the mirror, which is that disc I showed you. The other materials, I can't find a material correlate for them in the tomb itself. But we've got two of the five. And so I show you this as a way to suggest that at least what we can begin to think about now is placing those masks into what I would call a bon context. And those of you who know anything about Tibet know that, that Bon is just this crazy thing that's either very early, it goes way back in distant prehistory, it's the indigenous religion of Tibet, I don't know. I mean, we, we talk about it a lot, but we don't know much about it in terms of the early thing that we might call Bon. So I'm just offering this as a possibility for the way in which we might interpret these masks. Just to be fair, I am going to show you John Belaze's interpretation, which is quite different. Um, he doesn't believe that the golden masks really have much to do with, with, these, uh, with my ideas here. Um, really, hardly anything in his interpretation of these documents uh, supports anything that I say in terms of the mirror or the masks, but that's all right. Um, we, we all have our opinions on the way these things work. Clearly, I'm going to believe what something Carme says in this context because it supports what I think is going on in this context in any case. So here's the key, though. It appears that, again, there's a bone connection I'd like you to think about. So now we're going to go to Lubra in Mustan. This is in lower Mustan right now. It's a place that Charles Rambles studied extensively. I'm going to talk about a little bit about this thing called the Dos Ceremony, which is a ceremony that's essentially done at the end of the year. It's sort of a, a clean up and, you know, kind of get rid of all the bad energy and start anew, start afresh. And it's a fairly complex and long ceremony that's involved to uh, you know, do this process in this village. I should point out that Lubra is probably the only, la it's the only, that's the only remaining Bon village in all of Mustang right now. That is, the folks who live here are, are true Bon practitioners. And so there may well be others in the valley, but this is a concentration of them that have maintained their religious practice for some time. So in case you didn't know about it, you need to understand how to make chan. I mean, it's, it's something that is relevant to this conversation. Um, I would ask you to start with the rice in this instance and then go through those different stages. Uh, you add some, that fob is yeast and of some kind and that's basically the starter that makes this ferment. And then you store it and then you drink it as chan. So why do I, why do I care about this in this context? It's a complicated argument but I'm circling back to the, the point. So at the end of this ceremony that Charles has described in great detail in the document that you see down below is the citation, is that there's a, the final stages of this is something called the transfer of stewardship. And what takes place under this transfer of stewardship is that uh, two individuals that had been the, the nominal leaders of the village are now leaving that post and two others are taking their place. And so there's a special rice beer that is made at that point. It's called Tsemo Chan, and it's a very special one. Not, it's a little more complicated than the one recipe that I showed you just a moment ago, but its point is it's a very clear, very not potent in any significant way in terms of alcohol, but a very clean white rice beverage. So it's made clearly out of rice, and it has some material culture that goes with it that is specified in the ritual as it's prepared today. And that ritual is there are two vessels, one that has Tsemo in it and the other that has a different Chan, 
which is used as part of this ceremony. It has a ladle that you take, scoop out one of the, the contents, and then pour it into a different container. And then the third thing is that that container where the Tse Mo Chong sits is on an iron tripod. So these are things that are essential to the uh, ceremony and that the iron tripod is wrapped in wool or white copper. And so this is how Charles sees this, this process unfolding. You've seen these all before. You might not have seen them in detail, but now you're gonna see them again in the National Geographic standpoint. And if you look very carefully, what do you see in the upper right-hand corner? You see, you see the big pot, you see the ladle, you see the smaller pot, and you see the um, iron tripod. And just to prove that they actually existed, because I don't want you to think that I made this up just because National Geographic told me to do that, here they all are. But there's another part of this that's really, this is, this is when archeology span gets even more fun. The ladle, you see that. You see the large vessel that's down in the bottom left-hand side. I believe that is the one that had the other Chong in it. The smaller copper vessel was, this is the one I believe was sitting on the iron tripod. And that bamboo cup is a cup that has been used and it's not what they use today as some other kind of a device that Charles describes as a flask. Uh, we won't go there particularly, but I show you these images because what we did in archeology span in this case was we looked at two things. We looked, could we find any direct evidence of what these things may have contained? Or if we can't find direct evidence, can we make some inferences about it? Well, we got lucky on these things. So that bamboo cup in the upper left-hand side, uh, it did not have rice grains in it, but it had rice protein in it. So we were doing proteomics, basically. In other words, you're looking for proteins that signal a particular kind of substance. Well, it's got rice proteomics in that. Unfortunately, none of the other metal vessels contained any evidence directly of this, but the one thing that did contain, contain evidence of this ritual process is that iron tripod, which we find in the context, and it had wool, um, it had wool proteins as well as wool wrapped all around it. And we actually found, if I go back one more, the uh, ladle had wool proteins all around it as well. So clearly there's something interesting going on here. We've got rice, we've got rice proteins, we've got wool, we've got other objects then that signal this ceremony that we have taking place. So this is interesting. I mean, if you, if you believe there's a certain level of cultural continuity here, which I think is plausible in Mustang, what you're looking at is a, something that looks like an analog to the transference of stewardship in this context. There is a reason I bring this up. I keep saying that and I'm getting there, okay? If you just, if you didn't, and we have bamboo cups that have rice grains in them. So uh, there's a lot going on that's suggestive of this ceremony that is reflected in the 2-5 context. So let's review some contexts now just to give us a sense of, all right, we're heading now toward the explanations of how these objects got to where they are. So I mentioned that there was a lot of north-south and the southern polity at this time in Nepal is called the Chavi. And we know that there was Buddhism in the Kathmandu Valley at this time, you know, in this, in this period of time. They're clearly there, but they were very busily making vikharas and being, you know, good monks. They did not do these, these more quotidian things. So this is a very different kind of Buddhism and clearly does not seem to have had any significant influence moving up into the valleys, but it's there. So did anybody from Lichavi sponsor this? I don't believe that's the case. North-South trade certainly existed, but I don't think, again, it was the, the source of those Buddhist objects that we see of any of the motifs or in the styles of the ideas or what have you. It's not coming from the north. There's nothing to come from yet. That is, we're still a little bit ahead of ourselves. You know, if you, if you, you know, the Tibetan histories talk about uh, Songsen Gampo, you know, establishing Buddhism in the, in the court sometime around, you know, 650, 660, give or take. This is still a little, our stuff is a little earlier than that at Samsung. So it's unlikely that that is coming down again. And besides that would be court religion, not what I see in these funny little contexts in these chambers. I do believe there's a very strong Northwestern Himalayan connection. 
It goes somewhere that way. Where exactly? It's kind of unimportant to say exactly where, but it's very clear that you know some of the stylistic motifs, some of the objects themselves, um, they clearly are coming from a Western direction. The local context, if we go back to Samsung for a moment and think about what's going on in terms of, um, I, I try to refrain from calling it a religious tradition only because I, I don't know if this is religion. I can describe it to you as a mortuary context and undoubtedly had religious or r ritual components to it. So, you know, we've got uh, people being buried in shaft tombs. We've got people being placed in wooden coffins or on platforms. Uh, we have plenty of animal sacrifice. These caves are full of people's animals being mostly heads, but other parts as well. So this is a very different context than one would find in a Buddhist setting. Um, one thing I didn't talk about in this uh, presentation, but others is that the way in which the dead were disposed of in these shaft tombs is quite interesting. Um, we were able to determine that each of the individuals placed in them had been defleshed and their bodies had been um, I guess decarnated a word, I don't know. But you get the idea, their bodies have been, the bones have, the bones have, the flesh has been stripped off their bones and the bones show signs of that process. Infants, men, women, boys, girls, everybody was defleshed and put into the context. This is clearly not a Buddhist kind of activity, although some people have tried to make claim that it was, but I don't think it is. So it's very different in terms of the local context, as you see. And so is this bone, well, geez, you know, don't pin me down, but there are relationships here. You know, that ritual that I described, the, the transference of a, a sponsorship or stewardship, probably. The gold masks have something to do with it as well um, that Sempton Carme describes and we've talked about. Is it bone? Something related to it, probably. All right. Now, let's go back to our images just for a moment and try to pull this all together. Uh, I can't say much about these being, you know, dating these in any other context other than what I have in Sanzong. You know, swastikas, they're all over the place. They're very early. They're found all over the world. I can't say much more than that, except that I do believe they signaled some kind of a Buddhist presence. Okay? Now, this is where it gets really tricky, and you can, you can call me out on this, but, you know, we have to try. Unfortunately, this object, you see it's broken already. That is, we went back to Samsung to you know, do another photo shoot and the locals had you know, stored, stored it you know, and it has now fallen apart. So there's, a, there's an image. I want you to look really carefully and see what we can see about the way in which the hands are formed in the mudra. It's important that we at least make a try at this. And we can always say, well, we can't do it, and we'll have to go back home again. So let me, let me try to suggest what's going on here. Unfortunately, you can see that the left arm is coming this way, but down into the lap, right? But you can't see what the hand is doing. But let's pretend for a moment that the hand is going like this, just to start with, OK? Now, take a look at the right hand. We can see the arm fairly clearly, and you can go all the way down to the fingers but it makes a difference which way the fingers are going. If the fingers are going this way, that's the earth witness mudra, no? Can't see the fingers. You can see two of the fingers, can't you? You can see two of them kind of shaping this way. If it's going this way, that's the mudra that's involved in welcoming or greeting or generosity. What do you think? It's okay to say, I don't know, because I can't say either. It could be either one of those two. Yes? Not clearly. Not clearly. No, I agree. It has to be that touchy because of the light. Good. It's too low. It's too low. And that is that's higher up. Good. It's too low. So I'm happy you have <laughs> another opinion now. Well, the other hand, the, the left hand, it's not going to gesture. Not, not the way the arm is crooked. So the, the arm, that hand has to be in his lap, so okay. we can forget that. The Good. Other, so the other one turns, so the interpretation turns on the other hand, and his hand, so it said, it comes down quite far. So it's 
So I, I feel comf I feel comfortably personally saying it's there with the, you know the, the touching the ground when I mean I if I had we had the fingers I'd be a lot happier but you know I think that this is close enough and I appreciate the agreement. It, it's important that at least for my argument it's important it's there because it's also connected to this as well. And if you know there is a cult of the stupa that's out there in the world about this time. And although many people talk about the cult of the stupa is actually building stupas on the landscape because those are supposed to hold the relics of the Buddha or script that goes along with you know, the Buddha's words being placed inside these, in these stupa. It's clear from the Indian tradition as well that they're actually putting, they're creating miniature stupa as well. All right, so they're not simply just making big ones on the landscape, they're making these little ones. Although I couldn't give you a definitive date, remember I was having a hard time pinning it down, it's clear that when you read the literature that people are describing this cult of the stupa as being out there making miniatures of this kind. So we've got a miniature of a earth mudra, earth, you know, earth touching mudra. We've got the cult of the stupa that's beginning to spread. It spreads from its Indian heritage up into the northwest and then Obviously, I'm suggesting what is it doing, S circling back down again into the, from the northwest into this region. And now we can finally sum it up. The northwest works for me as a conduit for much of what I've talked about today. I think that the appearance of that satsa with the, with the earth touching as well as the appearance of the chorten is very much connected to the, the images of the Buddha's enlightenment, which is part of the cult of the stupa as well. That's what the texts are supposed to say when they put them inside the stupas themselves. So I think there's a very clear connection, at least in my mind, between that satsa with the earth touching as well as part of the cult of the stupa that's again coming from up and back down again. These symbols though, they get inserted into local traditions. That's, they're not taking anything over. I mean, if you take a look at the entire mortuary process at Samzong, nothing is going on there that is you know, becoming a more Buddhist practice. With that animal sacrifice, with the way in which human bodies are being processed in these contexts, the way everything tells me that this is something different and may well be very much bone related. So I call that small scale Buddhism. Uh, there was an article by another fellow that used that term. I'm using it in a slightly different way to say families or lineages, some of them are picking this up. And whatever their motivations are, I can't answer. But clearly it's motivation enough to place and take the time and expense to create a gold mask with a swastika and put it into a mortuary context, as well as the other objects as well. Um, the very large number of people though are not using those symbols. They're simply staying with what they've always been doing. How that's being spread? It could be, it's certainly by trade. We know that there are Buddhist missionaries that began from, you know, lived in the Northwest and came down the Himalayan arc around this time. So it could easily be being spread by those folks. Some people are, um, you might say, infected by the Buddhists in missionaries and this material then is placed into those contexts. And finally, here's what I call my, my bonus speculation. Here's a bonus. You notice that we had some gold masks in Western Tibet. And none of them, none of those contexts, those tombs have no, they have no Buddhist materials in them whatsoever. There are no tzatza. There are no, um, sorry, there's no golden, there are golden masks. None of them are decorated beyond what you saw. So why don't they have even a bit of reflection of some of these traits? Well, you could argue they're not picked up by anybody, so therefore it's not important. I have a different way to think about this because if you look where these tombs are, the Gurgim Cemetery is right beside the, what I would call the putative capital of Changchun. Right, I mean, it's right, I walked over it years and years ago, didn't know it was there, 
sadly. I couldn't have, I wouldn't have been allowed to dig it anyway. But the point is, I was, it, it's right there. The one in Nadi, which is the Chuthag, is again near a very important, um, probable Shang Shung Center. What I'm really thinking is that those golden masks are certainly part of a local tradition inserted into this, probably from the northwestern Himalayas. But the reason why that the Buddhist motifs don't seem to be placed in them, I think that Shang Shung is quite strong here. I think it, what it's doing here is it may well be simply not providing opportunity or context for the placement of those sorts of objects into those tombs. Now, that's speculation, entirely bonus, but yet I think it does work for me in terms of why we see them here and why we don't see them elsewhere. So that's my presentation, and I will end by simply saying thank you to all the people who gave us money for doing all this work, as well as the colleagues I've had that helped me figure out some of these things, and of course the very kind invitation from Nathan to come and talk about them in this context. So again, thanks very much for your time and for your uh, attention.